We are live. A ver, we are live. Hi. On Twitch, not on the podcast yet. <laughs> so many fans. Yes, it would not be subtitles without, without this process. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be something else entirely. Um, a ver, vamos a... We're about to record. So, three, two, one. Get ready to be amazed. <laughs> Blown away. Get ready to be seduced. And abandoned. abandoned? Is that what it says? That <laughs> ends kind of melting into the D. But you get it. I think the mo modern terminology abandoned, is ghosted. Abandoned. Seduced and ghosted. <laughs> seduced and ghosted. <laughs> ghosted terminology. Oh. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to another week of subtitles. We have had a major, major hiatus. Yes, we have. Uh, so for those of you who have forgotten um, who yeah. we are, I am Cristina Ochoa. And I am Karen Gorostieda. That's my full name. <laughs> And this is subtitled, um, sorry, subtitles in Spanish. In Spanish, that's right. And um, yeah, we have had a bit of a hiatus. We took a few weeks off to reformat a little bit of what we wanted to talk about. Yeah, and also crazy shit happened. So much crazy <laughs> shit happened. Yeah, and we're gearing up for more of it. So and Yes, and it was really tough to say, definitely Tuesdays, we're going to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and it's And then also the last few times, just... The world didn't want us to do anything. <laughs> we would we get, get a together. Gas leak scare, and the fire department yeah. came. Yeah. <laughs> Things happen. All anyway. sorts of random emergencies and, and stuff happening. Um, that was fun, though, the, the, the fire department thing. It, it was. We had a, a bit of a scare with a gas leak, and then they came. It wasn't really a scare. They're like, ladies, it's fine. Well, we weren't Nothing was really going to happen. It was a loud, uh, very loud wishing, worrying, that whatever it was, and it really, there, it was letting go of a lot of gas. Yeah. It was also, what do you think? Um, yeah, it, there we go. <laughs> it also felt like, uh, it was one of those things where we were feeding into the drama. We were definitely encouraging it. We're like, oh my gosh, we almost died. And, yeah, sure. ooh, we feel high. Not a real thing. No. But we but still, we, we're really into it. We, you know, entertained the idea that we would explode the neighborhood. Excitement like for excitement's sake. It was on the way, in fact, we were coming to this little spot where we record, and it was because of that small outing yeah. um, that we smelled this horrible smell of gas. And anyway, so. So. Today. Today is all about uh, seduced and abandoned. Technically not a movie in a foreign language. No. So to be clear, but it is a movie set in con and also about making movies. That's right. Um, and it felt very appropriate and like a really good jumping off point for some of the other conversations that we want to have. A lot to talk about. It's a movie, a doc about making movies, mm -hmm. and it's set in the, like she said, it's in Can, Can, and uh, that's the... Can. Can. <laughs> that's, uh, besides Can is. TIFF. Mucho más fácil en, en español. <laughs> besides TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, it's the other super huge international marketplace, and the one that has the most kind of ooh-la-la -la wow factor, yeah. right? Yeah, the glamour. Not anymore, of course, but mm -hmm. when this was made back in 2013, or it was released 2013, it yeah. still had all that. And, so James uh, Toback, who is the director of the film, uh, partners up with Alec Baldwin, and they go, and they're basically shooting what is, it's a documentary, but it really is a behind the scenes almost right. on the filmmaking process. And their whole premise is that they want to make a modern version mm -hmm. of El Último Tango en Paris. Last Tango in Paris, starring yeah. Mar Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando. And directed by the famous Bernardo Bertolucci. Yeah. And I think the twist they want, or the version they want, is a couple of war correspondent mm -hmm. right, journalists who meet up somewhere in the Middle East. They hadn't really detected, or detected, determined where it was. Um, and they also, it starts off in New York because they're talking to Nev Campbell, mm -hmm. right, who they want to be the co-star. And for those of you that haven't seen Last Tango in Paris, myself included, but you know <laughs> that it is a no. sexually bonkers film. Yes. And that's how, and they're, they're prefacing all yeah. of their conversations. They're like, well, esto va a ser, it's going to be 
very sexual, very graphic, mm-hmm. but really because it's very intimate and we want to tackle these topics yeah. and we want to talk about it and Nev and I could be a great match and we could do it. That's the way Alec Baldwin was kind of like selling the movie. Mm-hmm. He just came off of 30 Rock. He wants to do something, a big departure, you know, from that character and his TV persona identity. Yeah, I guess to get back into film, a lot mm-hmm. of this touches on bankability as a superstar, mm-hmm. whether or not you've got it, um, and what international financiers think of you. And it doesn't have to do so much with like film no know- like knowledge or, you know, deep love of cinema. It's about so, whoever's got the deepest pockets mm-hmm. and ultimately some pretty simple math. Yeah. And it's all kind of internal math. It's not a spreadsheet. <laughs> it's like she wants out. Yeah. Nev wants out. She can't do it. Yeah. Or you even don't Alec, even like anymore. oh yeah, you're not. You know, if it's Ryan Gosling and yeah. Diane Kruger at the time, you know, they were kind of two of the stars, or uh, Jessica Chastain, right? And they were talking to them, and they're like, oh, they are very popular. They will sell you box get her? office Did internationally. You get yeah, yeah. So it's also interesting to see the level of. Um, not stubbornness, but kind of like loyalty that they have or don't have at times, depending Mm -hmm. on who they're talking to, in order to get funded, a lot of the promises that they made initially, they can't uphold. They can't promise Nev that she could, you know, they're like, well, maybe we could have two women and Nev could play the other character. Right. But, you know, we get the main star. I love her, but... But... Yeah. mm -hmm. There's always that button there. Of course. But maybe... But maybe... (laughs) Also, if you have not seen that, it is a hilarious portion of a stand-up show with... um, It's Louis C.K. Yeah, Louis C.K. encountered some complications. Yeah, some uh, controversy. In the not so recent past. that portion of the stand-up special that he has of course but is maybe. of course but maybe it's brilliant, brilliant. um okay i mean say he most oh yes. and one of the things that they highlight the most in this movie i think mm. because they talk to so many stars and this glamour this idea yeah. of the red car the famous big giant red carpet at can and like all of these things and you were telling me that there's all these articles talking about how that's probably done now too could yeah could this be the end of the lavish premiere yeah. Could be. Um, I don't know when the next time anyone will feel comfortable enough to pack into a theater, stand in line mm-hmm. with a bunch of photographers, because you've been on the red carpets, Christina, and it's just what you don't see or what the, you know, what the audience doesn't see is a packed, like, two or three rows deep of, of reporters, you know, kind of... Yeah. You know, trying it's, to get it's in a, there. the bleed, what is it, nosebleed section? Uh-huh. That's what, it, at a concert, it feels like that, but there's photographers, mm. where, you know, like, where when they're against the fences and, and the air, in the front, and in. they're all leaning forward, and they're right. trying to, like, get to their, the singers and stuff. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing, but with the photographers all trying to get the right angle and right. trying to position themselves. So they're definitely, you so know, that part risk. alone. Yeah. Oh, it's already a problem walking yeah. in. You're not even in the theater yet. And I think, too, I people maybe have this like the zeitgeist is getting back to basics and the idea of putting on a fabulous dress to celebrate um you know a movie and the other people not being able to go out and so on it seems kind of against yeah and mm-hmm. and and also kind of how it started mm-hmm. initially all that whole tradition was based on theatrical uh, experiences right like it was Broadway? like a theater like the red carpets and the mm-hmm. you know the grand entrances and stuff like that which actually brings me to, I think, something that fits for subtitles, which is the expression, hmm. mucha mierda. Yeah, I, I don't hear that in Argentina. <laughs> oh, what do you hear in Argentina? What is a common, it's our, the equivalent, for those of you who don't know, it's the equivalent of break a leg in Spain. We say mucha mierda, which literally translates to lots of shit. Yeah. I don't know. You don't I know? mean, in Argentina, suerte is every five it's minutes suerte, luck, suerte, yeah. suerte. but I don't know in, in, in film or, or yeah. theater what they would say no so idea. well mucha mierda actually I mean the etymology of the expression is pretty interesting because it also goes back this is to, a fun story. Yeah. Yeah, to the theatrical mm-hmm. kind of you know golden era of horses and carriages coming to the theater on opening night so instead of telling people to break a leg which I actually can't quite remember why that is the expression no idea um, but in Spanish, we say mucha mierda because on a very successful opening night, 
there would be a lot of horses and a lot of carriages. So at the entrance of the theater, there were these barriers where you would shake off your boots and the boots would be covered in shit from the horses that were all pulling up to the entrance of the theater. Yeah. So when you had a successful opening night, you had a lot of shit at the entrance of the theater. <laughs> and it stuck. It, <laughs> much like the shit, it stuck. It stuck. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so back to, so that's just like our idiom of the day, I think, yeah. for today. Mucha mierda. Mucha mierda. Yeah. Can you shorten it to just mierda? No. <laughs> Probably not. Okay. <laughs> if you just say shit, Different not meaning. good. If you say lots of shit, good. Yes. Okay. What was that uh, comedian that said, shit is such a versatile, there were, it was a foreigner, mm. it was like, oh, because you can uh, be the shit. Yes. Or you can be a piece of shit. And you are. Or you, very yeah. different things. Yeah, Right. It's very versatile. Yeah, it had like a whole, there was a whole comedy special. Yeah, she was very we funny. can find it, we'll link it at some point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so sorry, yes, let's carry on with, um, you know, the, the review of Seduced and Abandoned. Yeah, I mean, so the gist of it is financing. Mm-hmm. It is a very glamorous romp to the hottest locations in Cannes to beg for money. And that's yeah. what it is. It's mm-hmm. begging for money, it's you know, um, fancy hotel rooms yachts, and mega meeting yachts, with, with all the individuals, <laughs> exactly, whose yeah. fathers probably made a lot of money mm-hmm. and who now have reputations for being high rollers, big investor, investors or bon vivants, whatever. Um, and, but it doesn't always work out. You know, a lot of these guys aren't that willing to part with their money. And even if it's Alec Baldwin and we're, we're impressed by him, we think, Hey, this is a guy who's done it all. Mm-hmm. Still not enough. Yeah. yeah. They were asking, I think at the uh, beginning, they were asking for something, uh, you know, along the $20 million range, right? Wasn't I it? And then they, yeah. I think that the, you know, the financiers would just come back and say like, well, you know, if you get, again, Jessica Chastain to do it, then you have, we have a conversation. Yeah. Um, but as is, maybe we'll give you Ten, like five. five? Yeah. yeah. Um, Painful amount for Hollywood. Yeah. Well, it's also yeah. a very tricky amount, right? Because when you talk about funding and financing movies, a lot of the time, if you're going to under five and you're doing the a tiers, one, right? yeah, like a one to five million dollar movie, a lot mm-hmm. of horror movies have this kind of a budget, a uh-huh. lot of very fast paced, you know, Blumhouse is, is exceptional at making under five movies that then internationally do really well, yeah. whether it's video on demand or they have a release. Then you get to the hundred million dollar budget, which is the big, the Avengers, you know, to go further up from there, of course, 180, whatever million. And you have like the big guaranteed totem poles, prequels, sequels, whatever. Yeah. And then in the middle, you have this space where a lot of indie films are, you know, kind of trying to make it work between Mm -hmm. five and 15. And it's a very difficult budget to kind of, you know, navigate and justify. And it's not really, they don't understand the ROI on it. It's really fucking tricky to get that space. Yeah, it feels like if it if it's under five, mm-hmm. everybody's pulling, right? Everybody involved, actors aren't getting paid much, everybody's saying, we're doing this on the cheap, yeah. we band together. Mm-hmm. Crazy budget, everybody want, gets what they want, or at least attempts to. And in the middle, then it's like, well, who's taking the hit? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, I and who's that's making the bank on the return? Yeah. I've, I've heard, though, too, now that, um, now that everything's just being released mm-hmm. uh, for streamers, that the marketing budgets are just almost gone. So at least that's money that they can count on keeping or at least not budgeting in. Mm-hmm. What used to be like, okay, we'll have a $50 million marketing budget. Not anymore. Like, they don't care about putting up billboards. And if they do, right. family Netflix It's all online like, viral marketing, yeah, probably. Maybe maybe LA and New York. You know, Netflix probably has mm-hmm. a few, like, billboards that they put up. But other than that, I was like, yeah. that, that was pretty interesting. There are a lot of, let's call them big releases that also snuck up on me. Um, what was this Charlize there? Um... The Charlize Theron one that we saw, Which one? they're like not legendary. What is the name of it? Where they they don't die. <laughs> oh yes, we saw, I can't remember what it was called. Anyway, yes, that yes. one that snuck up on me. Mm-hmm. Like one minute nothing, the next minute they're like everybody's watching this. I'm like, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the, the new viral campaigns, if anything, and the word of mouth and the yeah, that's kind I'm of like an the island. Way to go. The viral didn't reach me. I know. <laughs> 
<laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that we're um, seeing a lot is the new modes of advertisements. I know PR companies are also really struggling with kind of what they're doing now, too, because of that same thing. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've been noticing a lot in Hollywood is people, movies, releases, projects, or whatever, kind of banking on this idea that let's call them either influencers or people in positions of... You mean my neighbors? Yeah. Mm, yes. Actually, uh, I have an teenagers. influencer neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> and a Netflix neighbor. That's true. I am sandwiched yes, by yeah. that experience. Um, you're, you're, you know, protected. Yeah, yeah you're protected. protected. <laughs> That's right. And still from, nothing gets to me. Oh, my God. From autonomous thought. You're protected from any... <laughs> Anyway, sorry, continue. Yes, so, um, you know, the idea that these uh, people are capitalizing on spreading the word in new channels, new medium, without the middleman means the budgets get kind of skewed. So yeah. um, I know, for example, um, se me, se me, nombre, um, Matthew McConaughey, for example, yes. who's been making the rounds, all the podcasts, oh, right. all of the, you know, promoting, for example, his book, his book whatnot. Yeah. Somebody was talking about how he didn't need to do any kind of publicity, mm-hmm. standardized publicity. So the publishers were able to make either more copies or really give another bonus or whatever, or focus more on different assets as opposed to trying to market it because he was just going to go on all these new viral, you know, the Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, Howard Stern. Not film related. Mm-hmm. But marketing related, yeah. just a quick aside. Yeah. Airbnb, mm-hmm. which a lot of people thought, oh no, you know, the pandemic, in fact, is having its best year ever. They nixed basically their entire marketing budget. Turns out they didn't need it. Right. So now they're going to have this huge, uh, like surplus, I guess, in, in their in their income this year, their revenue, because they're doing better than they did before marketing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, that's it'll be interesting to kind of keep an eye on that for us specifically for this podcast now with, with film and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting topic. Yeah. yeah, and I also think that one of the good things that's happening, at least for where we stand, because that's the kind of content that we love to review and watch, is international or national borders mm-hmm. when it comes to content and media are even more blurred. There, it's even yeah. easier to get access to subtitled movies or foreign language films. As a matter of fact, it's even encouraged in production. We see it with content development. We develop That's projects, right. and people want foreign language, you know, mm-hmm. films, um, and and TV shows. Yeah. So I think that it's really interesting because all those things that we've talked about, like oh, we want this to happen, we want this to happen in the industry, we want people to be more in you know, on favor of watching foreign features and things like that, instead of remaking them all the time. Yeah. Um, You know, we wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, this movie, we wanted to review, we also got it confused because we thought it was the Italian. (laughs) That's right. So, Seduced and Abandoned is... uh, An Italian feature from the 1960s. Right, but then, like, there was uh, some confusion because it was an American co-pro or something like that. Yeah. And Christina said... Actually, it's an American film. I'm like, wow, that's weird. Yeah. All the Italian names. It was like names Pepito or like yeah. Piccolino. Or <laughs> intensely Italian cast, yeah. considering that it's not, but it is, in yeah. fact, Italian. And we streamed this we one, it. and it was fascinating anyway. So we were like, let's just go with this one anyway. It still yeah. applies. But yeah, funny enough, this was um, Seduced and Abandoned was an Italian feature that we were aiming to review we'll for this podcast. We're still figuring it out. You know, technical difficulties. Hey, man, this thing's evolving. Slowly but surely. I think we're getting to like a really good place. We're we're a lump of coal being compressed into the diamond. Mm, okay, well let's right? make sure let's hope it's a diamond and not like a cubic zirconia it's a that comes diamond. out of the <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. Or is there um, is there another gem uh, that <laughs> through compression evolves like more quickly that we could probably <laughs> It's aquamarine. It's a yeah. it's, it's a soft emerald. orange topaz, okay? <laughs> Still. Well, recently we were in Zion, and one of the things that was, like, really interesting, what was that one, uh, the topaz, but it was called something like Harlequin, or it was called... Oh, God, yeah, um, I remember the gem irid- store. It was, like, a be- beautiful iridescent Gorgeous. gem. Gorgeous, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So if there are any uh, geologists out there that want to, like, talk to us... Send us stuff. giant samples of, of beautiful <laughs> gems. That we can review. We'll yeah. give her... Um, just give us the Latin name, and then it'll be subtitled. Yeah. We'll cover shipping, but that's it. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, I think that's one of the major benefits that I am, hmm. I'm noticing with the removal of the distribution models that we used to have. 
um, which is the middleman is now being removed. So you don't have judge and jury in between the creators and the filmmakers and the consumers. Mm -hmm. Right now it becomes, I mean, you still have issues with your funding and you still have all those issues, but you really have people who make something the way they want to make it without somebody telling them like, well, do this because that's our market. It's like, now you find your market. Now you don't need, you know, the standard studio models in that way. Everything, I mean, like in music, uh, there's so many categories now and everything, everything is kind of becoming niche in a way, Mm -hmm. right? You never have to see something you don't care to see anymore. Just like on the radio, you don't. You don't need to listen to a regular radio station. Yeah. Just, you know, do satellite radio or go on Spotify and you could custom customize everything. Yeah. And probably you'll find, I mean, my guess is, you know, smaller films, lower budgets, because people also want to avoid large uh, crews and all that sort of thing, makes it much more nimble and mm-hmm. you can film in other places, which is probably why we've been hearing, hey, you could set it anywhere, rather, well, anywhere that's not, you know, neck hey, deep in, in viral load. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But um, And I also think that another thing that it, it is huh. happening a lot is inside the, the content, media, everyone is, you know, people used to target, like, what is the lowest common denominator? How can we hit as many households right. as we can? Or how can we have as many viewers? That was the metric. That was the standard. Um, I no longer think that really is the case I think well now with Facebook and all the data mining Mm -hmm. you know exactly who you're marketing to whereas before it was like women men teens now it's men who buy this particular brand of toilet paper and also watch the Super Bowl but also Mm -hmm. um, read Hemingway read Hemingway it's that specific (laughs) How many of those are there? I mean, <laughs> so many. You know what? If there's 20,000, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. know. Um, but th- that's, yeah. Mm-hmm. So now our marketing tools are also so specific, thanks to us having unwittingly given up all of in- our information. Um, we'll get exactly what we want. Mm-hmm. And also, I was listening to an interview mm-hmm. um, on, on Strictly Business, on Variety's podcast about this, where yeah. the head of... Um, Netflix was kind of talking about some of those metrics and how they actually now quantify success differently as well. Okay. And how they are tracking projects that people, for example, how quickly they binge through them. Okay, go ahead. Meaning it's not enough just how many people watched this 10-hour series. Yeah. It's how many of them didn't stop after the first episode. How many of them... Wow watched the whole thing because they were compelled to finish sooner rather Mm -hmm. than later versus another 10 episode series which maybe people don't pick up right away or they leave and they start and then they leave halfway through and then they resume Mm -hmm. different metrics for those two and I think it's really interesting is like because yeah we do prioritize and give more value to say the filmmakers or the writers the creatives on the shows yeah that maybe are watched immediately right. or the ones that they don't hit stop or the ones that they, you know, watch to completion right. and the ones that they do so in a faster way mm-hmm. and the ones that, you know, all that stuff now is becoming part of that metric yeah. of success and value. It's fascinating. It's also scary. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, we watched also another documentary, The uh, the Great Hack. Oh, The Great recently. Hack. We did. After having seen The Social Dilemma, which was going viral, and a friend of ours, Rapin... A good parent. Yeah, told us to watch The Great Hack, and it is, especially leading up to the election, um, and, you know, kind of like everything that's going on with, and what happened with Cambridge Analytica, and all that controversy. And it's also been happening with Facebook again. They've been getting into a little bit of hot water uh, on the East Coast, I believe. Mm Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, that was kind of one of the things that if we try to apply that to films Mm -hmm. and content and media and extrapolate some of those lessons and talk about how they could affect our industry, um, it really is the idea of using TV, which I'm pretty sure I've seen in superhero movies, right? Mm -hmm. Like a a, a supervillain using TV to, like, hypnotize. Oh, sure. Was that that The Incredibles? What movie? Many movies, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, where it's... uh, Or even Batman, the one with the Joker, right? Didn't he use TVs to control... It could be. 
the only image I can actually think of is Poltergeist, which is not a super villain, but it's still the the haunted house communicating to that little girl. Yeah, it's a super entity. It's like the the snow. Yeah, yeah. But it, what it is, it's something yeah. where it's like all of a sudden mind control via our mm -hmm. devices, via, and that's kind of what is happening. Yeah. Right? Which For is sure. with these things. So it makes you one i think for me it makes me have a more profound awareness and respect for the kind of content i consume mm -hmm. knowing that i have some freedom to pick what i want to consume yeah. obviously but most likely i'm still getting catered to things depending on what i've consumed for in sure. the past all of us i think have been have had certain videos and and videos movies uh suggested to us all the infinitum time. Yes. <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, I get it. You want me to see this? Okay, fine. And I have given in. Yeah. I'm like, to the machine or really? whatever you want to call. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, all right. I guess you guys know me. And um, it, it's a funny thought, mm -hmm. but it's also, yeah, kind of creepy. But to some degree, I think all of us are not just comfortable, but probably well, not grateful is an incredibly wrong choice of a word. Um, but no, nah, it's comfortable. Yeah. Like, okay. You guys know. Well, I think like, we've also... How do you deep dive? You have to keep... Because it still is suggesting, no matter what the category, you're still getting suggestions within the parameters that you've unconsciously set for yourself. Yeah, well, if you think about, you know, the, the amount of information and the polling that a company like Amazon has, yeah, let alone Netflix, but Amazon, who not only are you buying and consuming content on Amazon Prime from, but you're also, they have your preferences, the brands that you tend yeah. to buy, the things you tend, you know, like everything. Um, so the books that you're consuming. Extra creepy. I have some fake plant, the fiddly fig, you know, one of those giant kind of fake fig leaf plants yeah, that you always yeah, see I have in one architecture magazines. Yeah. Yes. My brother was outside. We have one outside. It fell down. Five minutes later, there's a suggestion to buy the exact same plant from Amazon. And that, that was it. That was so, so crazy. Okay. I'm like, is it watch? Is there, are there more cameras? Is his own phone like, oh, that thing fell. I guess it's broken. Hey, mm -hmm. need a new plant? That was creepy. Um, that was a bizarre moment. Because it wasn't just like us talking about leggings and getting a mm -hmm. leggings commercial. It's a random physical yeah. thing in the world falling. Okay, but correlation, not causation. Maybe if that had been recommended and it hadn't fallen, you would have dismissed it immediately and not thought about it about Well, it, we, it happens to be the exact same one. It wasn't some random other plant. It mm -hmm. happened to be the exact same plant, same height, four branches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Sorry. Now we know. Now we know which one of us is more likely to wear a tin hat. <laughs> I'm kidding. Conspiracy theory. Um, but I, I, yeah. I, I know what you mean. I mean the coincidences are weird, but I also will say I think a lot of the time we interpret because that's what cognitively we're designed to do, right? Yeah. We interpret things. I may not have noticed uh, a plant being recommended on mine, but I would notice dog food. If it just so happened that day I run out of dog food, right. it's like, oh my god, how did it know? You know how? Yeah. Um, but yes, I, I, I totally yeah. understand. But I guess to bring now, it back to the the larger things, yeah. to the movie, which is the bankability of stars. And stuff, yes, that's from seven years ago, mm -hmm. and now, like you're saying, we've got this really uh, precision marketing happening. So I wonder what that means now for bank. Some people are. Oh, Chris Hemsworth is going to get, you know, what. A, roles that other people who might be equally good or handsome or whatever but don't have that same bankability mm -hmm. but now if you could target market like um you know who i haven't seen in a long time michael Sarah, like a michael Sarah type movie mm -hmm. you know that kind of indie stuff that's what yeah. it was like oh indie but now if you can target indie like well but i think it's it's interesting because i don't necessarily i think there may be a divide mm -hmm. of target specific content yeah. versus artistic craft content. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think is going to happen is there was a moment there where we were headed down this terrible rabbit hole where art, craft, creativity, whatever it is, was suddenly um, monetized in a way that made it seem like, oh, 
if you're successful at this, mm. you can have the best of both worlds, right? You can be the artist that also does an indie feature that then wins the Oscars, and then all of a sudden you direct Avengers 25 or whatever it is. Okay. Um, and now I think what's happening is there may be more of a divide, but we're going to start losing that because you're going to start seeing people who are basing films on commerce, and they're going to be doing that. Yeah. They're going to capitalize on this moment. They're going to be like, great, I have all this data. I'm going to I'm gonna house of cards, right? Which was based on, okay, all of the successful input of Netflix and all their yeah. data. They created a show based on, okay, people like watching this. They like, at the time, they liked <laughs> Kevin Spacey. They like this. They like that. Yeah. And that was proof that it worked. Yeah. But then you're also going to have the other side of it, which is people who are like, I refuse to to cooperate in that even if I'm a part of that system I refuse to embrace that I'm going to do what I want but it's going to go back to that time where artists weren't necessarily viewed as people who could have immediate, instant, fast or very large success in that way. Mm -hmm. They may have social standing but financially there was there have been periods of time throughout history and in different cultures where artistry was not financially remunerated Remunerado? Remunerated? Remunerated? Mm -hmm. Sure. Ooh, Let's say financially rewarded. Re that makes yeah, throw that's out better. remunerated. Remunerados, guys. Remunerados. Remunerados. Um, and I think yeah. that that also matters um, because you've always had those people. You've always had the people who are doing it for a love of the craft mm -hmm. and then get caught up in, say, a blockbuster and hate it. Yeah. And then that's a disaster. And the people who are happy to be doing a blockbuster or whatever it is. And, you know, they probably are more successful at doing so, but they're not necessarily crippled by not being able to do, you know, the movie with about the, the you know, the, the addict's journey through this and, like, over three months that's going into, like, these dark places. Mm. So I'm, I'm okay with it. To me, it's kind of like the idea of we can't not accept it. No, it's happening. Right. Like, music, when music all of a sudden we had, what was the, Napster. Right? Was that the torrent oh, thing? Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. What happened there? Everyone was freaking out. Yeah. That's a loss of money now for the music industry yeah. is disrupted. Blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. Because guess what? The person, it's just dividing different people. The person who is going to buy the album or the CD or the whatever is not the same person downloading it. I'm it's, not sure. Really? Yeah. I, I think I, I it's not the same audience. I think some people will always, yes, buy and say, I want to support X audience. I think um, a lot of people can skate by saying, oh, this band, it's Metallica. They already have millions. I'm mm -hmm. not going to buy the album. You know, there's no support notion there. Metallica um, being one of the most vocal bands against uh, against that sort of thing. Um yeah, I yeah, I'm not sure about that. I really? think some people are definitely gonna say like, well, may, or maybe I'll pay for this band, but not for that band, mm -hmm. or it's only a single. So the gray area, I think, is pretty, pretty significant when it comes to like buy and trade or share. Really? Yeah. I just feel like there's the industry is the one that the infrastructure is the one that has to yeah. adapt, and not the consumers or the creators. Meaning books when audiobooks started coming out mm. when pdfs started being available people would download pdfs from books that they wanted to read yeah. versus buying the book for five dollars or whatever it was um that person is not the person who's going to the store and buying the book anyway if they can get the pdf for free they're going to get it for free mm -hmm. right the person downloading music what happens then there's a shift in the industry Spotify's, Amazon Music, iTunes, whatever, where now you're subscription-based. Most people have these services. They're not downloading torrents anymore. Most people can get access to music for free, but they don't own it. Okay. And then there's some people who still want to buy CDs. Great. Now artists monetize by number of plays. Now yeah. there's a tracker, and that's, and that's what has and, to happen. And they're pretty unhappy about it. Because the amount's not... You also like have mm. the loss of the concept of an album and what it means to be an artist. Well, that's and, nostalgia too. Yeah. Well, but that's part of what our artists like creating albums. They could crank out singles, but then you know, if you're, if you're just a singles machine, uh, I think, I think musicians really do like doing that. Oh, this this is a period of my life or mm -hmm. something. I mean, I, I don't put out albums <laughs> or anything. I don't make music. 
Yet. Just a band, just yet. a listener. But soon, Sub- uh, um, subtitles is going to have a, a soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, it's it's all changing really rapidly, and it's um, everybody's desperate to monetize it because you want artists to be able to continue making art, but at the same time, there's a big disconnect I think between the artist and fans a lot of the time. Like you know, you now on Spotify, you just find, oh yeah, remember that song? Find it. Okay, there it is. You're not. Um, going through a box and a record and looking at the artwork and remembering this and that. So it's it's like super fast consumption of the music and I think a real detachment from them and sometimes easier to just uh, probably cheat your way or you know not pay for the music than it is to be like, oh, I'm that person who's going to make sure I buy the full album to celebrate their efforts <laughs> and to support their their cause. They're, they're going to be... I think Radiohead might have had a model about like kind of pay what you want now granted radiohead they're doing fine nobody's worried about radiohead but i thought that was kind of interesting Mm -hmm. i wonder what the uh yeah like a donation based consumption pay five dollars for my album pay 25 Mm dollars that's probably where you might find your answer because that's a question of like well you know i yes i want to pay but i think your songs are worth 25 cents each versus Mm -hmm. you know two dollars each or whatever it would be yeah yeah, I mean that that might it. that might be um, a yeah. really good gauge as to how much people or that individual pri- like prizes yeah. or values music content whatever. Back right? in the CD days, I must have bought two of each of those albums because one time a book of CDs of mine was stolen, and also the times I lent it to somebody like give it back, mm-hmm. which of course you never get back. No, of course. Yeah. Just like regular books. They're, you just yeah. don't ever get them back. Never. I just assume that they're... I will buy, yeah, yeah, three or four of something to gift because there's no way I'm ever getting back a book. I think yeah. I've given so many books away yeah. and never gotten them. Um, but anyway, so, so with movies, yeah. it kind of, I think, that what's, what's interesting is, at the same time, the threshold of accessibility mm. is also exponentially, you know, being lowered at the same rate. So now anybody can make a movie with an iPhone if they fucking wanted to. Oh, what was that movie? Tangerine was like that. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that one. So it's like, if you want to make a movie, technically you can. And people are doing them now with, um, like, super uh, high-functioning kind of digital cameras now, right? Like, little handhelds that mm-hmm. look like yeah, actual this size there's camera. There's people who've done them with iPads, because, like, all with iPads, iPads it's all 1080. So it's like, at this point, you know, the camera, yeah. the lenses and whatever, you get very high quality for the same thing. Um, and I think that is also a threshold of like an entry level. Anybody can make a movie, right? Yeah. Anybody. And then with a computer, you can edit. Yeah. And with a vi- there's open source of anything. Mm-hmm. So I also think that it does. That actually breeds creativity to me as 100%. well. Yeah. Without the motivation of like, okay, but this is, it's the indie singer putting it out on Spotify. His metric is probably not how much money am I making. It's also how many people are hitting like or enjoying my music. How many people are listening? Can I get a, re- you know, a, a record deal later? Can I, do I have a fan base? Do I have, can I do a concert? Whatever it is. I, I don't know. But that would be, I think that metric, that gauge is shifting the same way technology. We were talking about how IP and tech is the new asset. Yeah. Right. It's not gold. It's not property. It's not this, it's not that. Um, tech is, well, I feel like with film and TV internationally, we're finding out that, um, connection to an audience is a new metric. We don't have the right ruler yet, Yeah. but but it, that's what matters. Mm-hmm. They don't know how, but the person who hits the button and hits play when that show, when that episode is over, somehow that show is more valuable than the person who waits till the next day. Yeah, right. I think that's fascinating. I don't know where it's going to lead, um, but I think it's really interesting. A friend of ours, T, um, who has a, a digital podcast uh, show yeah. now yeah, right. called The Distillery, raised a really interesting question hmm. about creativity and should we share creativity with others? Is it like a share the wealth or is it each man to himself and to each his own? Um, and one of the conversations that was started there was also about this idea that this uh, tech guru gentleman who was on it was talking about how all of these things have been predicted but we were talking about the time scale and they right. were predicted 10 to 15 years from now. Right. And the pandemic 
semi expedited everything. Yeah. And yeah. so now we don't really have predictive models that work for the foreseeable future because we can't predict that fast what's going to happen now. Yeah, and that'll probably just keep happening in different ways, mm -hmm. in different uh, whatever technologies and formats. Uh, yeah. we're, and we're still, although highly sophisticated, pretty dumb machines. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're not going to evolve as quickly as technology does. So, um, uh, yeah, we already have some ill effects. We're getting very philosophical. Yes. <laughs> I was like, as should we, we keep should. going down this route? As We've we talked should. about these sort of things, too. About, yeah. I mean, creativity uh, springing forth from everyone is fantastic because I think creativity is good for you uh, and good for every child to express themselves mm -hmm. artistically and everything like that. I wonder about the when it comes to like the the discovery of other people's creative output, right? And the, the indie versus huge, like grand scale thing, just mm -hmm. going back again to bankability and what it means. Yeah. You know, I think the indie thing was so much about kind of, uh, I always think about a record store, about going through and discovering, right? And now you can market at that person mm -hmm. and kind of spoon feed them indie, indie. choices. Yeah. I just think it's like when, I, when we were talking about the awards and can and, yeah, I'm squeaking, yeah. aren't I? I can't, I can't hear the squeaks. Um, I have a mouse under here. Oh. <laughs> He's adorable. Um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, you were talking about the indie. Um, oh, I think I know where you were like going. The Independent this... Spirit Awards or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Even like you're gonna now need another level of something that's like maybe a non-streaming platform. Mm -hmm. Like where is the True the new, indie gonna be? Yeah, is it is Twitch? <laughs> Probably Twitch films. Twitch films are the new thing. I vote for that. Um, if it yeah. happens, Twitch. Yes, we want to be Sponsor on your us. yeah. Or uh, we could be for... a, we could judge some new Twitch output. Yes, exactly. Twitch Movies films. on Twitch. Send yeah. us your links. <laughs> um, but uh, we actually yeah. have uh, another good friend of ours and another podcast that if you don't listen to, you should Mindscape. Um, which is Sean Carroll, and he has these really wonderful, you know, intellectuals and thinkers and scientists coming on yes. board to talk about very relevant, very interesting topics. So if you haven't heard it, go on and check it out. Um, but also, he had, um, I want to say it was like a social anthropologist or somebody, it wasn't okay. Carol Tavers, but it was somebody else, who was talking about how, funny enough, even though, say, pop music mm -hmm. was technically popular culture, it's supposed to be that lowest common denominator that people listen to, right. the most common selection of, ge of genres, if people were to click what kind of music do they listen to, mm -hmm. is actually indie or alternative, which inherently makes it not indie and alternative and makes it pop culture. <laughs> I wonder if because people like me, who are like born in the 70s or something, and also a little bit younger, indie, alt rock, whatever, was kind of popular music, right? Like rock music, like, think about. Yeah, of course, Bon Jovi. Whatever. Right, yeah. So if now that's most of the people tuning in. No, I just think in sense. general, it's, oh. it's a polling of when people ask what kind of um, genres do you listen to yeah. for music, people would avoid the term pop culture, pop, people popular. People say, I listen to indie music, except it's a majority of people listening to indie music. Except it's 70% music. of people saying indie music, which right. automatically makes it the right. pop culture right. music. Like Weezer would have been indie music, but you're like, wow, everybody was listening to Weezer, for example. If, yeah. Now, that, now it's pop music. Yeah. But I think pop now, yeah, it's it's indie alt rock, it's, it's the guitars, it's that, you know, drum and guitars type of thing, I think. It's no longer really actually indie, and then pop music is probably like a more like synth and ha like heavily produced. Mm -hmm. So well, it's the radio top forties yeah. version. That mu thats what I think most people associate with pop, yeah. right? It's it's the um, we used to have boy bands or whatever, and now maybe it's the strong female young, you know, the Taylor Swift and Ariana Grande yeah. and whatever. Yeah, and and I think that that you know is is really the way most people describe it. Yeah. Like, that would be pop culture, pop music. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I have a friend, Shannon, who works at the Grammys, and they actually really struggle with categories a lot of the time. I bet. Uh, especially because, like, again, it's there's just not a lot of, like, rock being made anymore. So mm -hmm. there is, but there's still a rock category, 
So who's submitting? Who are the judges? And is it, you know, is it just becoming a smaller and smaller category? And you're like, mm -hmm. how can rock be a small category? Well, it can be. Yeah. And there's just a few people, I think, um, contributing to it in any significant way, sadly. Talk yeah. to Dave Grohl. He's pretty pissed about it. <laughs> um, somebody yeah. asked us about, like, the online Google algorithm, and will that determine what popular will be? I Again, I think, you sure. know, yeah, we're, we're getting into metrics and how do you really define popular? Is it um, a number? Is it how many people? Is it the majority? Is that what's popular? Is it what um, is most in the zeitgeist? Let's call it is majority it, music. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, that's that's what it is. Yeah. Um, and will will it, that, of what, I mean, more than for music, I just think I'm thinking film, mm -hmm. um, you know, sure. like, will that be what people think popular is? Um, I also think social media plays an incredibly uh, important role in all of these industries. Mm -hmm. Anything that's audiovisual, medium, you know, uh, I think that we cannot forget how much these platforms push, influence, impact, and become the new word of mouth, the new uh, reference point, the new, oh, I've seen this ad on my Instagram 25 times. Oh, I've seen um, five friends on Twitter talking about this thing, and yeah. this here's the link, and I'm going to go into it. So I think that, you know, again, watch The Great Hack so great. as well, yeah. because it's really fantastic. And if you pair that up with a social dilemma, you'll probably yeah. have a it's crisis a and like reevaluate. It's disturbing, yeah. dash, enlightening, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, Speaking about uh -huh. moving forward and predictive elements, okay. we decided we are going to try and start a, a little weekly nudge talking about ideas that we think should get made. Oh, Ideals, right. hopes, dreams, what wishes. What would we like to see? What would we like to see? What would we like to see? Um, I think, you know what, I think I would love to mm. see something um, that maybe I, I would like to cast something okay. in my in my dreams go ahead i would like to put idris elba yes i know i can't help it emma Ew, stone no. yeah please okay. don't yeah. idris elba emma stone okay gina davis all right and michael fassbender Goodness, because at first I'm like comedy. Then I'm like June Davis. I'm like, mm. okay, you gotta make it smarter. Michael Fassbender. I'm like, sad, depressing. I don't know. But I would love to see all of them doing something huh. that is very comedic. Okay. Even though most of them are not necessarily comedic actors, maybe period Austin or is. current or future. Um, setting future, futuristic setting. Yeah. Comedy, um, and I future. would love for it to be futuristic, but adventure, kind of Indiana Jones-ish, you know, Jumanji-ish. Uh, without having the cast or anything, yeah. I want to see a big old swashbuckling movie, oh, like an yes. Indiana Jones. Yes. But I mean, I know they're not going to make them now, at least for. They a are. Bit. They're changing it. I think it's going to become a woman. Um, I oh, think no, it's not be Indiana. Indi Indi oh, just oh. Um, the making of those films. I guess maybe with a ton of CGI. But just like big cast, big locations, I think that's. That sort of thing I think that's where I think that's still gonna happen. I, I think people I are dying so, to do it. Dangerous. I think people are are really excited. Yeah. That is the kind of movie that people industries themselves are itching to make because yeah. that's the movie that's gonna get people to the movie theater, right? That's so right, yeah. theaters want to make it. People like it's just I think all around. What's people gonna are happen with theaters? Aren't they being rented out for like a hundred dollars for a few hours? You can rent an AMC mm -hmm. uh, theater for a hundred dollars that's right the whole thing and then you can just go have your own right you know for whatever length the film i assume yeah so the cats movie then <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay. i will say this is the worst way to make a movie is to like think of uh we were having this conversation recently where it's like you have all these great ingredients and you think they're gonna make a cake, <laughs> but it's right. like a mango and oyster. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not the tourist. I yeah, think great was a great ingredients. example of that happening right. and being a disaster. Yeah, um, it should work. But it doesn't. Yeah. To me, honestly, there are very few examples. I think I can't think of any now, but like where so many stars, like oh, the more stars, the better. No. Yeah. It's no. usually a failure. You mm -hmm. can't have too many famous faces up there. You can if they're kind of, one, I think if they're cameos and funny or cute or almost like Easter eggs. Um, and I think 
you know who did that was uh, Deadpool. Big budget, huge budget, would have like Brad Pitt come in to be electrocuted right. but for the main a guys split weren't. second. And Ryan Reynolds is mostly you don't you don't really you know you don't, he's Deadpool. Yeah. Which is like, I love Deadpool. I, very, I think very, it's very, fantastic. Very, it's very, very much. funny. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, but the new cast, like his little new crew, weren't mm-hmm. super famous faces. And the cameos are fun. But I, I'm trying to think of, I forget the name of that movie. It was like Martian, Mar- Mars Attacks, I think. It was one of these movies that had like a, a bunch of stars. It's like, uh, don't do it. Really? Yeah. There's been a couple of very recent, like, oh my God, Dune is going to have... I think me- like mega cast though. I wonder, I think that's I wonder a how mega to cast. I think Dune I'll is watch like, Dune. I'm gonna still gonna watch it. Too. I'm gonna like watch there's it. there's no way the yeah. the old one. I just remember watching it recently mm-hmm. again, just rewatching it. Yeah, and the sets. I was like, cool. I there's a little tiny part of me that wishes I had decided to go into acting sooner. Prior to, I mean, I don't regret going into science. I love science. But I'm thinking, like, if I had decided to be a child actor or whatever it was or something when to be I was the younger. Sister? To be no, your little no, sister? No, 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 oh. I'm just thinking about, like, the set design and how it was all real. Right now you're going up an escalator in a green room. Yeah. And everything that's really incredibly vast mm-hmm. is done in a studio in Pinewood in London. Avatar. You yeah. know? And, I mean, they're still in New Zealand, so they're doing amazing stuff, but a lot of the time they are in studio. Whereas back then, you would have these incredible sets. And, yeah, they looked kind of like Disneyland now, right? Where it's, like, the foamy concrete and stuff like that. But, God, it still must have been so incredible to walk into some of those. in the trailer, I don't see any any little sister. Oh, really? I I don't see her. I don't see her. No. I love Um, little girl. She's so weird. Yeah, but I mean, I, I don't really know. Um, okay, so we've covered what... Is there any other thing that you think should get made? Please make it, Hollywood. Please A make Idris, Stone, Fassbender, film. Davis. <laughs> that's it. That's all I want right now. Now you want that? Yeah, I, I get it. I feel you. I feel you. I know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that's kind of like our wish for the week. Yearning for adventure. That's... Yeah. And I think swashbuckling... Escapism, big theme now in content development. We see it all the time going into meetings and For stuff. For sure. Yeah. yeah. No one wants to make movies about pandemics. They mm. want to make movies. I want a hard dose of reality. <laughs> I don't know about you. I haven't gotten enough. Let's check everyone's hopes and dreams, shall we? For a minute. Um, yeah, I wonder yeah. how... You know, we're also not necessarily seeing a lot of the productions but elsewhere internationally they are still shooting a lot and they are shooting kind of naturally and they're doing things the yeah. same as they always have yeah. so it's really we are kind of in a bubble here in Hollywood as far as like the shooting mechanisms and mm-hmm. all these measures for COVID because I have friends shooting in sets in Spain or Croatia or whatever yeah. and every country has their own mandates everyone just kind of does their own you know yeah their own kind of thing and they're not really factoring in COVID the way we are here because it's, it's a different um, kind of, I guess, protocols and to play and financial burden. Well, we'll see. But yeah, see so if we get any overseas news about entire crews getting sick or something like that. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> let's call it. Let's make a company. Let's call it um, Bucket of Cold Water Films. Oh no! It's just <laughs> where depressing. everyone's everything are is like mice and, of men and yeah. men and like Schindler's List. <laughs> just guess very... what? You're not going to make it. That's it, or yeah. whatever it is. Oh yeah. man. Um, very French of us. Very French ending. Yeah, right. <laughs> and at the end, he died. And at the end, he lost his job. And at yeah. the end, he was They're on the street. Unhappy. And she doesn't love you. And what else? <laughs> it wasn't meant to be, by the way. Here's one more thing that I want to say. is We had this, um, this intention. Maybe we missed our chance at the beginning to do this. But we're going to put it at the tail end. Okay. It's going to work. What are we doing? Subtext. Oh, sub... Right. So subtext. For seduced and abandoned. Right. It's kind of like a, what it, what's the big takeaway from the movie or what are they trying to communicate uh-huh. really? Yeah. Uh. So in Seduced and Abandoned, I think the motto is, if you want to do anything other than a documentary, <laughs> become uh, an influencer. <laughs> right. Or um, stay relevant. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you are. Begging is never sexy. <laughs> That's kind of hard. Or if you have to beg. Yeah. 
do it better again. do it again <laughs> on a yacht. That's true. I like that. At That's a party, because at least you'll get swag. Hey. You get like a consolation prize at the end of it. That's at least true. Like yeah. if I'm like a nice cologne. If or I something. have to beg and I'm also getting like great hors d'oeuvres and champagne, I'll be like, okay, well this takes the edge off. <laughs> yeah. So that's true. Yeah, and at the end of it, that's you get a, a gown. Or better something. attitude. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, Ugh, I had to fly to a fabulous location and get. Yeah. So that's it. I think if you go into it, go into the begging process, <laughs> assuming rejection, so that when it happens, you're like, okay, great. One down, right? Yeah. Actually, there was a guy who changed his life by telling himself. He was uh, generally, I think, quite afraid and very mm -hmm. reluctant to meet new people. Was very, very afraid of rejection. And instead flipped it and said, my goal is to get 20 people to say no to me today. Yeah. And uh, so... Wait, yeah, where was that? That it, was in a book or something that we were talking about at one point. I, I must have heard it, you know, on our yeah. radio or where podcast or something. actively sought he actively out sought the rejection. rejection. Yeah. Because that was what we was afraid of. Hey, would you buy me a candy bar? Something yeah. as, as small as that. What? No. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And Thinking about yeah. becoming immune somehow mm -hmm. to it. Yes. But inevitably, what it actually did was gave him more non more acceptances, more than rejections, right? Like, wasn't it? Uh, I don't know if he necessarily got more yeses well, than nos. More, more than he got before ever even asking. Well, maybe. right. Ven por el sí que no, ya lo tienes. Exacto. Sí. That's a Spanish thing. That's why mm -hmm. I said yo and not yo, as I would with my normal accent. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, well, I just think suddenly he, you know, I kind of lost his fear of, of, of asking and interacting and so on. And I suppose to, like, at first his goal was to be rejected. So he's like, I'm going to do something that's going to be easily rejected. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you start yeah. saying, okay, let's try and get the yes. But the no won't hurt much anymore. It's like a, the Wim Hof method, like cold exposure. So you get no exposure, or you know, yeah. in quotation Negative. marks. Negative. Yeah, no. The no, <laughs> the no treatment. We got this. Who's got this? Um, yeah. Eyes bath. What is the last thing you asked for, or what kind of a a petition or a request do you fear rejection of? Oh wow, especially with work. This is a hard one. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, First off, too, I haven't been around many people for so long that like I haven't requested anything specifically. I I mean I guess help in a lot of ways is difficult to ask because you don't want to burden people. Mm -hmm. So that that sort of request. But I I can't think of anything. I haven't asked anybody for a candy bar, right? <laughs> a stranger for any anything. So um, yeah, no. Perhaps I just avoid it as much as possible, or I do my best to make my make a case for myself so that the request even if rejected like I, i'm still perfectly fine with the, re the, the request mm -hmm. right so hey i'm not sure if you guys give out this sort of information but if you do could you tell me what the budget was on xyz yeah um and so in that case i just think to myself like okay if i if i couch it in a i know you guys probably don't mm. give out this information now you know that i know you want to do it anyway then that's okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll do it that way. Yeah. That's from practice, I guess. <laughs> from being a grown up. You give people an out. Well, um, you guys, thank you so much <laughs> for tuning in. Uh, that is how long brand has that been? New, it's an hour. Good lord. Yeah. I apologize. Um, it's our new why? <laughs> Just no. kidding, I'm joking. Um, it's you're a joke. welcome. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed it. Um, we are getting a kick out of having these conversations. Yeah. So um, thank you for tuning in to another week of subtitles in Spanish. In Spanish. Watch Seduced and Abandoned. Yes. And uh, remember Mucha Mierda as well. Muchisima Mierda. Muchisima Mierda. Not just Mierda. Yes. Um, and um, thank you so much, you guys. We will see you next week. Oh, do we have we have a movie for next week? Oh, we do. The very highly controversial Cuties. Cuties. We're gonna watch it. French uh, film right now. Very controversial. Very much right. in uh, you know the the social movements mm -hmm. and and tackling a lot of those issues. The director I have here. Um, um, Maimuna Ducouré. Yeah. yeah. Maimuna. We hope we said it right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so let us know what you think. Send us your questions. And uh, much like Les Miserables, also children getting into trouble. Uh, ooh, yeah. So well, we uh, reviewed that one, and yes. this one's a di different, different kind. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. What's all the controversy about? I know. Um, my prediction is I'm going to enjoy it and probably 
defend it. Just, I have no context other than, you know, the brief information that I've had. Yeah. But I love, in general, French films. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that they tackle these complicated uh, issues and they make me think, even if I hate the actual thematic, I tend to appreciate it as a point of conversation. I like to make fun of the French and say, they will never shy away from putting young women in compromising situations. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, that's France. All, yeah, that's and all I, I love France, do. by the way. Yeah. And um, yeah. also it'll be a nice departure from uh, really the conversations leading up to them. So, because we are very close to this election and uh, we yeah. don't necessarily... A lot of people are already talking about it, so I figured that's covered. Yes. Just go vote if and you we haven't have yet. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in. Yes. Um, and we will see you guys next week. So that's Hasta another la episode of Subtitles. That means Hasta until luego. the next one. Yes. <laughs> Ciao. Bye. Um, yes, <laughs> thank you so much for that. Remember to vote. It was a nice reminder to give to them. Um, I really appreciate it. You guys, thank you for tuning in. Have an amazing <laughs> <Great> week. <job. laughs> yes, you too. <laughs>